Hi, I'm Jonathan Nunn. I'm here with Jeremy Stanley. We're going to measure Casper. Well, the first part of the hoofbeat measurement, we're going to show you how we do a visual overview at the beginning. First part of this, assess the horse. We'll have a look over the horse visually, clean off the feet and get ready for the, for the measurement. But the most important thing, we take the rug off first so we can get a good look at the horse's general conformation. So Jeremy's just going to take the rug off. Another important thing, as you can see, Casper's not standing straight. So, the first part of any static, static examination or an overview is make sure you're getting him stood as straight as we can. So have a good look at the limb, look at the limb conformation. So as we can see, he has a toe-in conformation. Um, we've not seen Casper before, this is, the, this is the first time at the stable we're looking at him. You know, he obviously needs trimming. He's obviously got a medial toe flare. Another good point to raise is look at your look at the, the limb alignment. Look at a line through the limb and the deviation from the midline. As you can see, there's more of the hoof on the medial aspect. For me as a farrier, in my everyday work, hang the limb forward and take a good look at the, at, at the limb, limb alignment as well, forward. That's just as important as, as looking at medial lateral balance from the back of the horse as well. So this is Casper. So we're going to give, give him a look over statically to begin with before we do the hoof beat measurement. Sometimes a good way, um, look at, stand in front of the horse and look at the, look at the feet in relationship to the limb as well. So again, straight away, my eyes drawn to the left front and both fronts are toe in. They have a medial toe flare. And this is sometimes the first aspect, the first point that we look at as a farrier is from the top side. So it's a really important part of the assessment is to look at the, to look at the, the top of the, the limb. A good way of demonstrating this to a client as well is to plumb line with a lead rope and you can see how much of the how much of the hoof is on the medial aspect. So don't be too drawn to the to the initial um, the initial part of this assessment. That that foot is drawing my eye straight away. The other hoof as well has the same characteristic. So <clears throat> what we'll do is pick up both feet, and we're in a relaxed way, I'll try and get Casper to hold his to hold his hoof to hold his leg, again, behind the knee, and look down the limb. And as we can see, Casper has a medial de deviation of the hoof capsule. But make sure that you look at both in the same way. So I'm looking down the center of the limb, and you can see the center line is, is going through the lateral toe aspect. Secondly, I'm looking at Casper overall. I'm looking at the conformation of his front limbs and looking at the aspects of his feet in relationship to the upper body and, and the limbs above. So knees, he looks relatively straight through the knees. Looking at the coronary band, he's, he's got a, a lateral slant on the coronary band again, more, more excessive on the left fore, not stood on quite uneven, evenly on the mats. As you can see, <clears throat> we need to assess always on, on ground that's not perfectly flat. So, the rubber mats are affecting, affecting his stance in this way, so just move him to a, to a point where we're happy, where he's stood on flatter ground. Look down, Casper, look on the little. So we're looking at, we're looking at him stood as, as well as we can, as, as we can see, the rubber mats are affecting the stance slightly, but we've, we've definitely got something to look at on the left front. And again, <clears throat> the limb above, looks relatively straight. He might have a, a, an offset knee on the left again. If we look at the knee conformation, offset radius medially as well. A good way of assessing the knee again, in stance. Look at this line on the, on the inside of the knee. There's a slight offset, so the radius is, is overset to the medial aspect. So again, making sure that horses stood straight and level and you're safe to stand behind the horse we look from the 
from the back of the horse, we're looking at the shoulders, we're looking at the shoulders in relationship to each other. This, um, this right shoulder is a rounder shape. Again, we'll move. So move the, if we move the mane out of the way, so we're looking at the shoulder symmetry. So no horse is symmetrical perfectly. Always we have, we have some difference in, in symmetry. So we're looking at the right shoulder compared to the left shoulder. Of course, making sure the horse is stood perfectly straight and with his head straight. If you could just move the head slightly that way, Jeremy, thanks. It's really important to, to look at the horse in, it, in this way because a lot of this, this is the way this horse is built. His, his framework, his conformation, um, he has this shoulder asymmetry. He's probably been born this way. And again, we're looking at, we're looking at aspects of the hoof and how the horse's skeletal asymmetry will affect. The last point that can be affected is at the ground. So, so sometimes a shoulder asymmetry, we can, we can help it, but his, um, his conformation is gonna dictate some of, the, some of the things that are happening on the ground as well. And we need to take all of this into account. So next, this is the part that we, as farriers, that we sometimes go to this part first before the, before the overall assessment. So picking up the limb and looking at the medial lateral. Now, a really important part, don't lock your hand on the inside of the limb. So this is wrong. This is how you want to be looking at medial lateral balance. Hold the limb, relaxed, again, just below, just below the knee, in line with the elbow, and sight it, and see it. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at symmetry, hoof symmetry. I'm looking at height, heel height, overall aspects. I'm not looking at the, at the level of the trim or the level of the hoof at this point. I'm looking at heel height. I'm looking at deformation of the heels here. And I'm looking at symmetry, medial lateral symmetry. So we can see with Casper, we're, we're a lot more upright on the outside. We expected that. He's got a deviation of the hoof capsule, but he's actually high through the lateral heel as we're looking down, down this hoof. And again, if we relate that to the, to the shoulder difference as well, he's really loading into this lateral aspect and we can see, we can see already we're starting to build a picture of, of the foot balance and Casper's simulated wear pattern um, of the hoof. So we assume when we, when we measure and analyse, are we going to get a horse that lands lateral toe? We're yet to find that out. Don't jump to conclusions. A good way of looking, looking at the, the balance and the symmetry as well is bring the hoof up towards you and try and, try and hold it in a relaxed way so the joints are, are free moving. And look at the frog in relationship to the, to the limb as well. As you can see, there's a deviation to the, to the medial aspect. Central sulcus as well. So central sulcus here. The frog generally doesn't move its position within the hoof capsule. It's, it remains the same. So again, we have, a, we have a medial deviation of the frog as well. Central sulcus. And if I, if I hold the, the hoof in a relaxed way, you can see how much of the hoof is is migrated towards the medial, medial aspect. And again, the, the frog's a big player in centralization as well. Frog doesn't move, central sulcus remains pretty much in the same place. So the ne next aspect, we're gonna, we're gonna assess the hind limb balance. Again, the hind limbs, we've looked at a quick overview statically. Familiarize yourself with the horse, make him comfortable that you're gonna walk behind him. You know, not all horses are going to want you to lift their tail out of the way. So make sure he's, make sure he's stood on all four. Get him st standing four square if you can. Can we just go back a one step, Jeremy? That's, uh, that's as near as we're going to get it. I think that's okay. Yeah. So when we talk about long axis and short axis, my, my assessment of, of hind limb foot balance is usually usually done on the ground. Um, so when we're looking at long axis balance of the hoof capsule in relationship to the limb, again, we can see the fronts as well here quite nicely. So stand safely behind the horse, hold the tail, hold the tail out of the way. 
And again, we can look at that left forearm as well. We can see the, the medial deviation of that left forearm really nicely now if we look through, through the hind limbs. And again, now we're getting, we're looking at the hind limbs in relationship to the ground. And again, long axis is really important that it's weight bearing. And you'll see in a sec, when we lift a limb, how that, how that changes the, the, the aspects of the of hoof balance that we're looking at as well. So again, a quick overview, look down the back of the horse before we start to pick any legs up. So next we can pick up the hoof and look at the foot balance and look at the, the wear of the foot. So a quick overview, frog needs trimming, there's some wear, there's a, there's a lateral toe flare, a wall flare here which we can see, make sure it's clean. And I'm looking at the, the short axis of the foot balance in relationship with the hoof capsule as well. So again, lateral aspect, as you'd expect, little more, little more flare on the lateral aspect, a little more upright, but high on the medial heel. Again, good, good frog contact, a little bit of toe wear on the medial toe aspect as well. So again, if we, if we hang the limb, we can, look at the, we can look at the overall flatness of this foot in relationship with the hoof balance as well. Some people like to look down the limb in this way, in a relaxed, again in, re, in a relaxed way to hold your hand in front of the hock. And look, again I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the balance of the hoof here, not in relationship to the long axis of the tendon because the the tendons of the limb on a hind limb don't run true through the, exactly through the centre of the hoof as well. So next we're going to sand, sand, the, sand the hoof where we're going to stick the velcro. It's really important to take away some of the, some of the flaky coronary band here, not right up to the coronary band, just below it because we're going to go just below the the hairline with the with the the velcros so again don't stand in front of the horse because often you know they don't know what you're doing uh, this is an unusual part for them and sometimes you'll get you'll get a knee in your face if you stand in front of them on this part so it's safer to do it from one side i do it from the same side some people do it like they'll swap and go around the horse so clean off the dust so the dust sometimes will affect the sticky velcro and again <coughs> We've got a deviation here of the hoof in line with the limb, and we've got to be really conscious of where we stick the, stick the Velcro. We've got a, a median line, a midline, uh, a fault in the hoof. So there's a little fault line, which may be in line with the hoof tubules, but don't follow that. You know, try and look at, try and look at the limb, the aspect of the limb, draw a line through the center of the limb, through the coronary band, Obviously you can see that deviation there. What I always do is I'll stick the top of the, the top of the Velcro, but don't stick it straight away. Again, see is repositioning. Make sure either the, the holder, the person in front of the horse is helping you sight that or move in front of the horse again. And, and make sure your Velcro is in line, in line with the long axis, the static long axis of the hoof. You can check it again underneath. You can check from the frog and see if the Velcro is in line with the, with the center of the frog in most cases. But it's really important to get the sensor in the right place on Casper's foot. If I'm happy with where it's positioned, stick it down, give it a little rub, make sure it's stuck down. You'll, you'll heat it a little bit as well. So. Casper's feet are quite warm, so these will stick quite well to his feet. But if you've got any dust from when you've sanded it, you know, it's really important to clean the dust away. Good lad, Casper. All right, we're done now. So we've cleaned the right front. Again, we've got a center line, a fault line through the foot. I wouldn't necessarily follow that. You've got to make sure that your, your Velcro is going to stick in line with the long axis. Again, just below just below the skin of the coronary band. Stick the top. 
Don't stick it down yet. Pick the hoof. Pick up the leg. Good lad, Casper. Look down the frog. Position. Position the Velcro. Happy with that. Stand in front of the horse. Yeah, maybe just twist. It's just twisted a little bit medially, so you can still reposition it. Stick it down. It's really important where these go because if they're too low, you're going to knock your sensors off the ground. Especially on this hoof, you've only got a couple of centimetres, not even that, to the ground. So if you've got a toe lander or you've got a toe dragger, which in this case he may be, the, the lower these Velcros sit, you know, your sensor's going to get scuffed on the ground, which you don't want. They're expensive. So, with Casper's hinds, there's a little more debris and, and, and bedding material, dirt on the coronary band, on the, on the lateral aspect of the hoof. So Jeremy's just gonna, gonna rasp it a little. We don't want these sensors coming off and the Velcro is the most important thing to attach the sensors to the hoof. Especially if you're measuring on a soft surface and you, we lose the sensor on the soft surface, you know, the Velcros are gonna fix, be what fix it, fixes it to the horse. So it's really important. It's really important to get a good fix with the Velcro. So if there's a lot of debris and dirt on the hoof, then rasp it before you sand it. Velcros, they peel at the top. There, so there's a, there's a part of the Velcro pad where there's, there's no glue right at the top. So again, peel it. And again, stick it in line with the horn tubes. It's really important. Again, don't stick, don't stick your Velcro that way. It's got to go in line with the horn tubes in the lateral toe quarter, just below the coronary band, about where a toe clip, a, a quarter clip would be. So again, there you can see in line with the horn tubes. We've got a nice line through there, which gives us an idea. If it's too far forward, if we're too far in the toe, we could get it knocked off. It needs to be where the, where the bend of the toe in the lateral toe quarter is. If it's too far laterally, then you've got a straighter part of the hoof and the sensor's got a curve. So we want to fit to the curved part of the hind foot. I always turn my sensors on prior to attaching them to the horse. So first of all, two second press, green light indicator, then I'll turn each of the sensors on. One, just in front of the logo, there's a point where there's a magnetic switch inside the sensor, so just below the logo, and you'll see each indicator light come on while the sensors turn on. Check your sensors. Fronts are red. Red Velcro for the right foot, again on the hinds. Hinds are black, red Velcro for the right foot. So I put them together like that, carry them in my hand, I put the remote control away so I don't press it by mistake. So I, I put the remote control away and attach the sensors then to the horse. Do you want to cut while I go in? So again, prior to measurement, I'm attaching the sensors to the Velcros, red for right. Attach it. Give it a little rotation. I can press it on and press the tabs in. Make sure it's firmly fixed within the Velcro. Check that we've got in line with the, with, the, with the long axis of the limb. Baseline, we've got distance here. I'm happy with that. If I wasn't happy with it, I could move it up slightly more. On a shorter hoof, we don't want to be too close to the ground. Good lad. Again, attaching your sensors, it's really important. Don't get your head in front of the horse. Um, sometimes, sometimes the horse will use his knee and strike forward. So keep safe, do it from the side. Attach. Check. We've got a deviation in this, in this sensor. We're gonna have, it's gonna be very difficult to center this because there's so, so much misalignment of the hoof capsule. So I'm happy with that. It's firmly attached. Attach the, attaching the hind sensors. So red for right, the black Velcro is on the left. Again just below the coronary band, 
making sure the velcro is in the right place, got good distance here. Make sure the tabs are pressed in and give it a little wiggle into the velcro. And keep safe with the hinds when you attach these velcros. If you've got a horse that's kicking, you can always pick up the leg, your velcro is attached, and you can attach it this way if you want, not weight bearing. Sometimes a bit safer if a horse might kick sideways. Attach it. Make sure those tabs are in. It's, it's always a good idea before you start the measurement, familiarise your horse that you're going to measure in the area where you're going to measure the horse. So I always walk and trot the horse in the area that I'm going to measure. Make sure I've got enough strides, count the strides so that you need at least 20 strides to start the measurement in walk and trot, a minimum of 20 strides. So if it's, if it's a windy day like today, to measure the horse is a good idea. Um, be, be, to walk the horse before the measurement, get him familiar with what he's got to about to do. You turn off in the time that you've gone to your measuring area, you can reactivate the sensors on the horse. Again, be safe. Make sure you're not in, a, in line to get kicked. So the sensor, the sensor will stay active. The remote control will stay active for two and a half, three minutes. So once we've got all of the sensors active, then we're ready to measure the horse. So walk first away. So you can see the rapid flashing lights. We're in measuring mode. So those sensors now are measuring Casper. And he can go out of range. You'll see as he goes out of range, the lights disappearing. Now all that means, all that means is we can't turn the sensors off while Casper's 20 strides away. But the, the sensors are still measuring. They'll measure for approximately 24 minutes entirely, but that's a big measurement, so it'll take a lot to download. So most of our measurements will be 20 strides in walk and trot, between 20 and 50 strides. 20 minimum. Again, he's out of shot now, so you can see, you can see, yeah, as he comes back into shot, the sensors are starting to reappear. And once we've got four flashing lights, then we can deactivate the sensors once he's back where we are. Okay, so one press, single press, and we're back into standby mode. It's really important, don't be distracted too much by the measurement and not watch the horse. So as a farrier as well, you need to not only measure, but also look at the horse in the dynamic aspects as well, walk and trot. So we're looking at Casper as well. We're looking at his placement on the ground, his hoof placement, fronts and hinds, rotates, laterally on the left hind as we can see there's a lateral rotation on on the left hind and again he's so far out of view now um, it's difficult to really look from this distance what he's doing but we'll see nicely when he comes back towards us his front foot placement on the ground as well and what's really interesting we guess at this aspect we guess oh how is that foot landing you know is he, is he toe landing? Is he heel landing? So we're going to relate that to the measurement again. Is he lateral toe landing? So again, we've got a lot of things to look at here. We're looking at the left hind lateral rotation, the right hind loading laterally. And again, we're going to look at all these things in the measurement. Look at the path, the left four takes is almost going in in front of the line of the right four so again he's he's really going to be prone to interference so now we're going to do a derived combo measurement on casper so we want 10 strides on a paved surface before he goes into the soft ground in that way we'll get an angle hoof wall angle measurement as well so jeremy okay when you're ready we're in range and now we're measuring, we want 10 strides of the horse before he goes to a soft surface. It's a windy day. We need to make sure that the horse is calm in a straight line walk.
And again, as the horse goes out of range, we've lost the indicator lights on the sensor. That means we can't activate or deactivate the sensors right now, but they're still measuring because we've got, we've got the blinking light flashing in quick succession there, but we're just not in range of the sensors. A good straight line trot, not too much head movement. As you can see, Casper's moving his head around. That's going to affect the measurement if we're not careful. Yeah, after the measurement's performed, be careful not to put the remote control in your pocket. We call it a pocket measurement. Sometimes you can easily press this remote control and take a measurement when you're not expecting it if the remote control is in your pocket. So either wear the, wear the remote control around a lanyard around your neck or keep it in your hand at all times. Try and keep it flat, don't put it in your pockets with other things in your pocket which might switch on the sensors. We've done the measurement on Casper and we're going to upload to the tablet. So we go into the Hoofbeat app and now we press and hold till we get the blue light. So keep holding and we have blue light indicators and in a second they'll start to flash rapidly. Then we know, we know that the tablet then is uploading from the sensors. So then you'll see on the left hand side of the screen we've got the battery status, we've got the sensor remote control status and the sensors are starting to begin to upload to the tablet. So now the upload is complete for Casper. We can see from the toolbar the indicators are empty now so we know all the information has then gone, gone to the measurements. We have three measurements that corresponds with what we know we did because we did one on the soft foot, two on the soft footing and one on hard footing. So now I'm going to add a new horse. So I'm going to put in Casper, description, this is where we are, Talbot. So we have additional information that we can put in there. We can put the location. Horse appearance, height at the withers, year of birth, gelding, bay horse, I think he's dressage or he may be jumping, we can do both and he'll be intermediate, save and close. Now <coughs> we can check, he's, a, he's in there, Casper, we should have Casper. There we have Casper. So we can either link by this link new measurement here, or we can go on the measurement and link from, from directly from the measurement. So I'm going to link new measurement. So then we have a number of things to work on, quality left and right. So I think I'm going to go minus on the fronts. Plus minus. So that's the quality of the hoof. So I think his, uh, his front foot quality was poor, so put him in the minus. Uh, he's towed in, not slightly, uh, and I think he's towed out. Stance left and right, towed in. Uh, stance left and stance right was slightly towed in. Bare foot. Barefoot, yeah, has no shoes. And then we, we can cycle through a lot of different options that we can add on. And then we can also add notes as well to the measurement complete checklist. Then we go to measurements to link. <clears throat> I always look at the time and the duration of my measurements. So 105, one minute, 52 seconds. So I know if I've got a 10 second measurement there, I may have had a pocket measurement I know I took three measurements, so we select, select, select. If you need to delete one measurement that's invalid from there, this is the best time to do that. Link measurements to the horse, and there we go. There we've got the measurement. And we can cycle through with this arrow to make sure we have all of our measurements. 
Yeah, due to the circumstances outside, the soft surface combo measurement, we didn't feel that the, the surface area was soft enough, so it was quite a firm area. We didn't, we didn't get the measurement we expected from the soft surface, so the, the combo measurement wasn't how we thought, and due to the wind conditions as well, we're going to measure on a real soft surface indoors and, uh, and see what that gives us. So to be able to take a combo measurement, we need 10 strides on a firm surface on hard footing, so on concrete or a paved surface. So in order to do that, I'm measuring now before we go into the, into the area. Yeah, I'm measuring. So what I would like to do is I'd like to trim, I've looked down my long axis, I'm going to trim this outside heel a little bit, I'm going to bring this inside heel to, to, to try and achieve balance, but the first job I want to do is I want to take away the flare here, because when I take away this flare I'm going to lose vertical depth, so I don't want to trim this before I remove the flare because of the vertical depth, so I'm just going to clean my frog to get a good picture to find the apex of the frog. I'm just going to pop it through my legs. I like to find the true apex of the frog for a look for balance. So now I'm going to dress the flare and then we'll see what we have. So I've tidied up my frog underneath and I decided that I'd dress the flare first. So I've dressed my flare that my hoof wall is now straight. So I have a nice straight hoof wall. I think I might take a little bit more from the back here, but I'm going to leave that just for my finished trim. So I'm going to bring the foot underneath now and trim the two heels and a little bit off the, off the bottom. Okay, so I've trimmed my frog a little bit. I still have a bit of a catch here I want to take out. Um, so I'm just going to, to finish my trim. I'm going to clean up the lateral aspect, the lateral sulci of the frog. And try not to take too much away. What's really important is what's left on the foot, not how much is on the floor. So now I'm going to just trim off a little bit off this lateral heel to bring the the length back now I'm going to look and see how much I want to trim from my inside to get that to balance so You have to always remember when you've got feet like this with a big flare on it, when you start to rasp your flare it's going to disappear very quickly. So that's why I trim the flare out the front first, first, that I don't lose too much vertical depth. Now I'm just trying to flatten the foot, trying to get a nice level surface for my shoe to burn onto. And you'll notice that at this toe I haven't being able to take anything away because the foot is excessively worn. So we've now got a relatively symmetrical foot. If we take a centre line, we can see that the distance from the centre line to the medial in relation to the centre line to the lateral is as similar as we can make it with the trim. I still have plenty of wall here where I've trimmed the flare to 
nail to and uh, yeah it's not a bad foot just like to take a little bit more out the front just here in this heel quarter just to make it a little bit nicer I'm just going to rub around with the rasp to give me a line to to rasp to so we'll take that out the front and I found the true apex of the frog so I can balance my foot around that there's still a little tiny dish just here but I'm not going to be trying to get that out on the first trim the flare has been there for quite a long time okay so I've picked up my hind foot I've looked at my static balance first job I always do I'm just going to tidy up the frog to try and find get a good picture of where everything is and that I can see what I'm looking at it's always for me it's always important to find the true apex of the frog I don't want to cut too much away there's a little bit of raggedness but more important what we leave clean out that bar clean the end off that bar this foot is this horse has been barefoot so there's not a lot of solar depth so all I want to do is just trim that inside heel I was going to cut it with the nippers but I think I'll use a rasp that's as much as I want to take off that foot I'm trying to preserve all the lateral wall I have it's a bit pointy, there's a bit of a flare in the toe so I'm going to take it out the front and dress it. You can see that the sole is just sitting above. I'm not going to take a knife to this yet. I'll ease it when I've done my burn. So I just tidy up my inside. I'm just going to take a little bit off that outside toe. I'm not going to dress that outside wall very much because it's a bit crushed. Run the rasp around that. Now we'll bring it back behind the horse again and we'll have a look and see where we are. Just want to tidy that edge and again the foot is low here. I get most of that with my burn. I don't want to overdress this foot um, but for the moment that's all we're going to take off. Clean my frog trying to be very conservative with my trim because the horse has been barefoot for so long just going to trim that inside heel a fraction Now we'll try and get a nice level surface for a shoe, but not much foot. And we'll take it out the front. And again, there's a toe flare we're going to address. better to leave the tabs on even if you're going to rasp through them because then you can place the scent the new new velcros where you had the old ones so sometimes you'll rasp through the bottom of them I just stick a new one on when I'm finished Again, we can see the length of heels and we can see how far forward the heels are from the frog. So I want to pull them back to the, the widest part of the frog or the widest lowest part of the frog. But again, there's very little solar depth on this foot. So I'll trim this heel, I'll balance this one up to it and I'll remove this flare. And Thank you. 
So what I'm looking at is the apex of the fog, the center line, the position of the last weight bearing point, that it's 90 degrees to this. Um, I'll then drop the limb, look for balance. Probably a little bit more to come off the inside, but I'm going to dress that flare and then take another look. Take away all this flare. You can see here, there's a gap behind the asp here. Can you get that on camera? There's a gap there. That's what I'm trying to dress back to, to get a straight wall. Horn tubules are very strong when they're straight. When they're bent, they're very weak. But we don't want to overdress the walls, especially on short feet. So now we have a nice straight hoof wall. We just go underneath again, take a quick look at that balance and I feel I want to take a little bit more off that inside heel. Uh, yeah, I'd like to take a bit more off that inside. But you can see here how this has dropped from me trimming the flare. So you have to be careful when you've got flares. And always remember, it's not what important what's on the floor, it's important what's on the foot. Just trim out that bar, a fraction there. There's a tiny little fracture in the bar here. You can see a depression in the bar, so I'm going to clean the top off that bar. We shouldn't trim our bars excessively, but when they start to flare and bend, it's better to trim them out. So a little crack like this, you can get a lot of debris behind and Next thing you have an abscess. So just want to trim out that a little bit there. I think that's enough. Okay. So Jeremy's trim Casper, we didn't feel we got a good baseline measurement with the distortion in the feet. So um, a normalizing trim trimmed off the medial flares we felt that we should do it to be fair on this this test we needed to have some sort of normality with the foot balance now we're going to measure on hard and soft and reanalyze we're measuring so now we're going to measure second measurement as a combo post trim so we, we trim caspers jeremy trim caspers feet just a normal trim and balance. We want to give we want to give this horse um, the fairness of having before we decide on the shoeing plan. We need to make sure that things are right on the measurement. So the control we felt was was not fair a representation of the good foot balance. So sometimes we discussed this before um, to get a true representation of good foot balance. We felt it was really important to, to give a trim. So this is second measurement on Casper on hard surface, post trim. We want to really see as a comparison, just how much difference taking away, taking away that medial flare, especially on the left front. We want to see how much difference that removal of the flare is going to make to the measurement because we we briefly analysed the first measurement and then after this me and Jeremy are going to have a chat we're going to have a talk about how we're going to apply the shoes there was a little bit of uh, farrier intuition involved in the first plan and we decided because the data was slightly contradictory to what we expected we thought we'd measure again and fair's fair so Myself and Jeremy 
we made a, a shoeing plan based on our farrier intuition. So we looked at Casper, we decided between ourselves, we, and then we both agreed the, the left front, we honed in on the left front and we saw the, the, the distortion was more apparent, the medial lateral imbalance. Um, we both said, yeah, if we were showing this horse without gait analysis, we would probably trying to give some some support to the lateral aspect of that foot. So we both decided, um, rather than lateral extension, we both decided that we would maybe give a symmetrical shoe, but with internal width support, because we assumed as farriers that that foot would sink into the surface laterally. So this is the shoeing plan that we made um, we, on, on, the, on the assessment only as well, our eyes, we decided that maybe the right hind needed some, a little lateral support, right front we were happy with as that, as, as that appeared, although it needed a trim. Left front we decided we, we, we needed to do a lot of work with that, so <clears throat> pre-measurement, pre-trim, then we measured and we uploaded the measurement and looked at, looked at the measurement, analysed the data and we're going to look at that now and then make, made a decision based on the data that presented to us on the hard and soft surfaces. So here's the first measurement we did on hard footing of Casper. So this shows speed, how many strides, so we know we've got, we need at least 20 strides, this part here will flag in yellow if we don't have enough strides. So we know we've got enough data to make a comparable measurement. General information here, uh, I added in the notes really early on. So sometimes the notes are really important to you. So add your notes if you've got multiple measurements, which we have here. Angle measurement, plus or minus two degrees accuracy. So we can see the left front was steeper, a steeper angle than the right front we can assume that because the foot was very worn on the lateral aspect as well. We can change formation and do a comparison here as well with the hinds. Angle measurement, of course, isn't applicable to the hinds. So we're gonna concentrate on, on the fronts for now. It was really important here because we wanted to see what the motion map gave us. So we can cycle through a 3D aspect, which is really we can animate that as well. So a movement of the three dimensional aspect. We can look at the side aspect, the top. And again, you can see that deviation, which with this throughout all of the measurements, Casper has shown this characteristic, apart from in the walk, but during the trot, this characteristic of the right, of the right four was apparent. Sometimes this could be, the horse has been led from the left if the horse is bending to the left, sometimes you'll get this deviation from the midline. Also, it's important to note halfway through the swing phase, there's a medial, there's a medial shift before the foot goes into landing. So we can animate all these um, as, as well. So if we go into the swing phase and the breakover, we can animate here in more detail. So breakover, landing, animate landings and this is this is a nice aspect and this always relates to to what we see with the horse we can slow down we can slow down the speed or speed up and then if we look at the landing spot the landing points as well in the location 13 milliseconds duration, 9 milliseconds duration. And as we, as we assumed, we asked ourselves, me and Jeremy, where do we think the landing, landing zones are? Very clearly there was, a, there was a, a tight landing zone of the left front as we assumed because that foot is really worn in that aspect. So we can assume that this horse has been working in walk barefoot and this lateral aspect has been has been wearing down more, more so. Interestingly, toe landing on the 
on the right front. More evenly distributed in trot. Let's look at the motion map. This is what we really wanted to, to, to look at with Casper, especially, was what happened to this foot during, during the mid stance phase. And we'll cycle through all of these aspects. We asked ourselves the question, yeah, what are we going to see? And we did see, we didn't see what we expected. We expected this foot to, to load, land and load laterally. It landed laterally, land, lateral toe, which we expected, but we didn't really expect the medial shift here. So you can see that. And if I expand on this, so there's a, there's a medial motion over the medial heel before going into breakover, which is this tri triangle here facing forward. So we have with the diamond mid stance, then the breakover triangle there. So before going into breakover, which was strongly lateral. So again, we analyzed this, this data over all of the aspects and we said, hey, you know, we can't base a shoeing plan on this. This foot needs trimming. We need to address that medial flare and see exactly what we're going to create. If we, sh if we form a shoeing plan now, we might be completely wrong. If we try and shoe this horse with orthotics based, based on this movement, which we see during, during mid stance and both walk and trot on hard and soft, we had this medial movement. So we did a trim and we re-measured Casper again. And let's have a look at that. So the great thing that we can do with hoofbeat, we can compare pre and post trimming shoeing as well. So as we felt Casper, it was going to be unfair to base the shoeing plan just on the first measurement without a trim. So we trimmed and we did a comparison measurement. So we've got a hard footing measurement. We're going to cycle through all the measurements. We'll check this measurement. So now we can replace this measurement with the hard footing post trim. So we have hard foot in here, left front. I'm going to replace this here with hard footing post trim. So now we have, yeah, we've got an angle difference, but don't forget the plus or minus two degrees of accuracy. So not, not a massive angle change. Jeremy said he was going to lower the heels. We knew that was going to happen. It's going to, it's going to make a degree angle change. So we cycle through, we can cycle through all of, all of these aspects and do a comparison. I'm going to, I'm going to go straight to the motion map here in walk. So you can see from on the left side is the first measurement pre trim and the motion map shows, let's, let's slow down the speed on the motion map shows on the right hand side post trim measurement. So you see this medial movement pre trim. This is what we were concerned about. This is when we looked at this measurement, we analyzed the data and we said, Hey, if we go with our intuitive farrier first thought, we're going to, we're going to shift this, this medial movement way, way over to the medial heel. If we, if we put a lateral wide branch on, as we assumed, we're going to change this horse, um, unnecessarily. So let's give this a good chance um, and do a trim measure again, which we did. And you can see from, from the measurement on the right side now, we don't have that medial shift. We don't have that medial movement. Yeah, the patterns, patterns have changed, but we've centralized, we've centralized mid stance, we've centralized breakover. So you can see we haven't got, if we expand this and we can see that that small movement during mid stance on the, on the, on the right hand side. And we've changed this. Yeah. But again, this is just a trim. It was a real simple trim. And we said, you know, we've got, we've got a fair crack at this now because we've given this foot chance to perform normally within normal parameters. So we went back to the shoeing plan and had another look. So based on the measurement, the shoeing plan changed. So again, the left front, which we'd overcomplicated with our intuition, 
we simplified it. We took away the wide, wide branch aspect and we decided to hone in on that landing zone where the, the hoof beat very definitely gave us an indicator that, that this, was, this was a strong landing zone, especially in walk. So that was a very, very clearly identified in the, in the measurement. We thought, we've decided that if we put a symmetric shoe on that, on that foot, then we would, we would give that foot enough support laterally without, without deciding to put a, a huge wide branch or a lateral extension on there, which again, if we did that, we're going to increase the lateral landing. So a symmetric shoe would, would clearly just give us enough width on the lateral to support the limb as well. And we decided to ground safe as well the landing, landing zone on the lateral toe. So now based on the shoeing plan that we've decided on with the hoof beat as well in mind, we'll go and see what the results show. So Jeremy has fitted a symmetric shoe to this foot. So even just, just fitting with symmetry and balance it's given, us, it's given us support through the lateral aspect. As we said, we were gonna define that landing zone which was strongly lateral toe area. And we weren't, we weren't gonna give a big lateral support to this, just support it normally and symmetrically. And just a balance shoe would give, would give us adequate lateral support. A symmetric shoe fitted well balanced, slightly under the toe, just to take away safer toe. So this shoe, which is, which is a Euro skill, sweetened up the inside slightly, safed with the grinder, just to, just to make sure we've got no sharp edge to tread. And a nice bit of, nice bit of support in both aspects as well, medial and lateral. We've got nice support there. Jeremy addressed addressed the flare as best he could. Couldn't get it all off. You know, we we're not going to get there all at once with this horse. We did the best we could with what we had. And again, a supportive shoe, symmetric fitted, slightly lower foot, lower angle, slightly bigger than than the, than the left front. So. Again, a nice break over toe as well. So again, same as, same as the left. Nice symmetric, symmetric support. Sweetened up on the medial aspect a little towards the heel. Safed off just to stop any treads. Yeah, because we're giving this horse a nice, nice amount of medial support as well as, as well as lateral. But what we found with this foot, fitting a balanced shoe, a balanced shoe to it's symmetrically, it's given us a slight amount, no more than the necessary, a slight amount of lateral support as well. Again, safe toe, good practice, set slightly under so we can safe that toe off. So prior to nailing the shoes on, it's good practice as Jeremy's doing now, just to ease the sole slightly so we don't have any sole pressure. Jeremy's already seated the shoe slightly with his hammer, but this was a barefoot horse and she was, as, as we know, she'd, she'd worn down that lateral aspect quite a lot. So we can see that through here. We can see just a little, some bruising through the sole there as well. Just a tiny bit. So it's, it's good practice to ease that sole away before we nail on. One thing we're going to make sure we do as well before we re-measure is rasp any protruding nail heads which we don't have at the moment there's just a tiny protrusion of the nail heads those are what are those city heads are these they're derby ESL4 yeah if I'm measuring a horse 
um, pre and post chewing, I'll make sure that I'll take the nail heads off for the rasp as well. They will affect your uh, landing. So that we take the nail heads off, it'll make a massive difference to your measurement post, post chewing. We shod the horse according to the shoeing plan and now we're going to reattach the sensors. We change the velcros, put new velcros on and we reattach the sensors and re-measure. So Jeremy's fitted this shoe as we planned, symmetric shape, shod to where the foot should be and we can see from this, we can see from this how much footwear is, is beneath that point of support as well. So. So the support point still is in, is in line with the hoof wall and we've shod to where the, the normal hoof should be. Not a huge extension, that's going to affect, we think that's going to affect our, our landings. Okay Jeremy, we'll turn the horse around and then once you start to walk I'll, I'll turn the measurement on. I'm measuring. Good active walk. The device will take away the, the side steps. So again, we want the head to be straight as possible. Not always, it's not always ideal. If the horse is going sideways and the head's to one side, then we need to consider that in the amount of strides that we're taking. If you take a minimum 20 strides, then the, the device will throw out the the poor strides or the sideways movement. So you'll end up, you may have 30 strides, but 10 bad ones. So again, if, you, if we look at the horse, heads to one side, we need to, we need to consider that slightly faster. It's a bit windier than before. Nice, yeah. So now we're gonna do a post shoeing combo measurement. So we're starting to measure now 10 strides into a soft surface. Again, we don't worry, distance away also go out a range of the remote control but the sensors will still be measuring the entire duration of this measurement the sensors will, will track the data and record it So we've uploaded our measurements post shoeing. We've got five measurements. So one of the sensors was knocked off on, on the second to last measurement. So what I would recommend is we delete that before we go any further and upload the measurement that was invalid. So we have five measurements. We know measurement four, the sensor was knocked out of place just as we started the measurement. So that's three seconds, best thing now, delete that one. Before we go any further, we don't want to upload that measurement as it's not going to show us any valid data. Then now we have four measurements to upload. We select, 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 select. So we had two on, two on um, the soft surface, 
and now we can go through to look at our measurements post shoeing. It's really important to make notes on the attachments when, you, when you're comparing multiple measurements. So add a note, click the share button, So this was soft footing and we did a left lead. As a comparison we led the horse from the other side. So soft footing, left lead, save. So then we've got notes. Cycle back with the, with the arrow, cycle through to the next measurement. So every time I make a measurement the first thing I do before I've even looked at it is make notes. So whenever we add notes, this is soft footing, post shoeing. If we want to share this report, we want to share the notes in the report, then you can click the share button and that will share all of your notes with the client as well when, or the other professional person that you share notes with. So we're going to concentrate and focus on some of the aspects of the measurement that we felt were areas that we should look at more deeply. So the left front compared with the left front. So on the left side we've got soft footing post trim so this is when we trim and balanced the foot and we surprised again we were surprised by the medial movement here so on the motion map we do a comparison so we can see if we look for, to the left side so that's the landing point where the where the red dot is in the is in the triangle so then we move into what should be mid stance again we're looking here the, uh, the, the diamond should be centralized within, within the ring of the motion map. So when the then into breakover and the motion map should be, now this horse is in breakover, but again, let's look on the right side of the screen now. So interestingly, the landing zone, we had this really concentrated landing zone here and that's changed, that switched to slightly more lateral rather than toe landing. This is in a more, more normal place that we expect when we compare measurements of very many horses, hundreds of measurements, we see a more lateral landing. Again, if we look at the motion map, look how nicely now the red dot is in the center of the diamond and we have the the motion map, the ring is fully is fully in one colour. So then we still got we've still got that medial movement which we expected. And don't forget we changed the we changed the shoeing plan. Our our intuitive idea as farriers were this horse is need this horse needed lateral support. The thing that we decided on the motion map, if we had given this horse lateral support, we would have probably amplified this medial movement and that we, that's what we didn't want to do. So we've gone from pre and post, so post shoeing, this shows it really nicely how, how the foot is more centralized after shoeing. So let's just run through that on a, on a speed and let you look at that. So you can see this this, this movement here is less exaggerated, less, less amplified. And I'd like to measure this horse again in five to 10 days. I think we'd see even more centralized loading during the mid stunts. So again, we're concentrating on the most significant aspects of the measurement, how, how we interpreted this. So we've got a comparison left hind soft footing post trim to soft footing post shoeing on the right side again the motion map and and we've got a similar similar to what we had on the left front a definite switch from this horse was toe landing and there's a definite shift in the in the landing aspect here and also look at the diamond in the center so what we want to see is this diamond as we move into mid stance you can see that shows it quite nicely. So the mid stance point is actually more central post shoeing than 
um, post trim. So again if we cycle through and look at this medial movement which the pattern during during this part is is similar into breakover and then there's, a, there's very definitely a medial breakover point but it's it's important and it demonstrates this quite nicely the center the center of of mid stance when the outer ring should have a complete color we should be looking at the diamond in the center of the of the of the hoof diagram as well and quite clearly on the post trim and if you can compare that to the post shoeing we've got a definite definite change in in the horse's ability to engage the mid stance. So finally we have a comparison of the motion map of the right hind as a comparison. So that if we look to the soft footing post trim on the left side of the screen and compare that to soft footing post shoeing on the right side of the screen again if we press play, we can expand that. We see we've got we've got a shift in the landing pattern. Again, we've gone from uh, lateral quarter landing to lateral heel landing quite clearly. But we, if we cycle through the mid stance, so the mid stance point is prior to shoeing is off center. So the mid stance point is lateral, and again. If we look at this complete ring on the motion map and the diamond in the center, although we've got medial, some medial shift, you would expect we've brought the, we've brought the center point of the mid stance more to the center of the limb load as well. And also look at the breakover, the breakover point has changed. So as we look into breakover, comparing left to right, of both on the left side of the screen to the right. Look at how the breakover is centralized as well of, of this hind limb. It was a great opportunity to work alongside Jeremy today and work on Casper and measure Casper with hoofbeat. It's been a long day and um, we both, at the beginning of the day, we both decided to look with our farrier eyes at Casper and decided on a shoeing plan. Coincidentally, we both focused on the left front heavily. Um, we were drawn to that foot because it, it showed us more distortion and we both decided that we would probably, if not without a measurement of that horse, we probably would have opted for a wide support on the lateral aspect of the left front. However, after measuring Casper and looking at the data, analysing the data, we realised if we'd have given a wide branch to the lateral aspect, we probably would have shifted Casper's weight onto the medial aspect even more because he was landing loading, so he's landing lateral toe and he was loading the medial aspect secondary uh, so he'd got a medial shift. So if we'd, actually, if we'd have actually put a wide branch on the lateral aspect we probably would have made things a lot worse. So it's a really good example of how sometimes it's not all evident from, from an assessment. We, we assessed Casper many times, we looked at his foot balance and the data showed us that we should rethink our approach and we followed, we followed that approach and made the shoeing plan according to the data that we'd got from Hoofbeat and I think we had a favourable result. So, so we've measured Casper again on the second day. He's a horse that probably has gone from barefoot to be shod. We made a few changes. He's a horse that I would recommend that we measured again in five days but day two he measured up really nicely and we were we were quite happy with how he measured and looked today so um, yeah good job Jeremy and it was great to be working with the Hoofbeat team.